Welcome to The Roll Forward, a podcast for the next wave of finance leaders, especially those looking to transform their roles by making smarter, faster, and more profitable business decisions using the power of technology and a forward-looking approach to finance. Listen in to learn how to get out of the back office trenches and become a more strategic partner within your organization. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Roll Forward Podcast. My name is Joe Michalowski and this episode is brought to you by Mosaic, a strategic finance platform that transforms the way business gets done. Today, my guest is Jervis Williams, CFO at Second Front Systems. Jervis, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Really, really excited about this one. We're going to dive deep into some career-related topics, but before we get going, do you mind giving everyone the background about who you are and, and how you got to where you are today? Yeah, so... Uh... As you mentioned, uh, first of all, Joe, thanks for having me on the show. I'm very, course, very honored, first of all, and, and very excited to, to be on your show. And hopefully I can contribute in a meaningful way. And so, uh, uh, yes, I'm, my name is Jervis Williams. I am CFO of Second Front, and I've been on the job now for 60 days. So we're right here in the middle of the onboarding process still. And before Second Front, I was CFO at Legion Technologies a SaaS, enterprise SaaS company in workforce management. And before that, I was at a hardware company, Metaway, and CFO there as well. And before my startup CFO days, I've spent most of my career in FP&A. So at companies early in my career, uh, Apple, HP, and then after that, uh, VMware, Citrix, Wind River. So I've spent most of my time in FP&A, but then I made the leap over to startup CFO a few years ago. And then most recently, Second Front and Legion are both SaaS. So now I consider myself a SaaS CFO. And, Careful. And that's don't, uh, <laughs> don't step on the toes of the SaaS CFO, Ben Murray. I don't know if you know oh, him, but we're friends. Oh, of yeah, course. Just careful, Jervis. You don't yes. want to get in trouble here. <laughs> I think he's got that trademarked or something. You got to be sure yeah. to watch out. Right, right, right. <laughs> I don't have to watch that. <laughs> I love it. I think, you know, your your background is perfect for what we're going to talk about today because we're we're going to talk about sort of the the life of a new CFO hire and you've done it. This is your third time now. The background, I think it's just perfect for all this. So we're going to dive deep into that. But I want to just start by talking about what what's exciting about the new role. What led you to second front specifically? Obviously, like you've got deep experience in some big names with FP&A and then even your CFO experiences, you, seems like you could add your pick of wherever you want to go. So curious, what uh, what led you to Second Front? What was so exciting about it? Yeah, so uh, I was approached about the opportunity at, at Second Front. And first thing that was very interesting to me, that it was a SaaS company, as I said, and that there was meaningful revenue in the first year. Mm-hmm. And, and to me, that's an indicator that they have product, that we have product market fit. So that was very interesting to me. And then the second interesting aspect was that the company is in defense tech. Mm-hmm. So we provide a platform for software companies looking to do business with the Department of Defense and the intelligence community. And so from a personal standpoint, that's something that's very meaningful to me in terms of the safety of our country. My first job out of UCLA was at Hughes Aircraft working in the F-18 business office. And so, and for my first job out of undergrad, that was a very impressionable job. I really just liked what I was doing. I liked the concept of where I was working on the F-18 radar program. And so it was, it was the radar for the F-18 fighter plane, which is the top gun plane, if, you, if you've seen the movie. Love and it. I just, I love all that stuff. Like Top Gun 2 is like my favorite movie. It was so um, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, ab- absolutely. And so then once I met the team, I was just sold. If you kind of go back to that you know, top gun team, it's really the, the, the company is mostly military. And I would say recent military. And now they're bringing in some kind of tech experience. I'm here. The CMO came from VMware. We have our actual chief of staff is from Salesforce. So now we're starting to kind of blend tech with military. But the military culture is is so strong in the sense that there's a sense of mission that's just consistent throughout the the organization. It's like everyone's on the same page. 
He's selfless. Everything's team oriented. You know, just great passion for what we do. Then just the camaraderie is, is absolutely amazing. And so once I met the team, also the team, very deep domain expertise. Mm -hmm. So our CTO was CTO of the CIA for years. Yeah. Our CEO was using special ops in the Marines. And we have all of these like cybersecurity nerds who just know this stuff inside and out. It worked for you know, the federal government. So I mean, how secure you know, can you get? And so once I saw the domain expertise, the size of the opportunity, the defense tech market is absolutely huge. And specifically for software companies looking to do business with the DOD. Right now, it takes just years and lots of dollars to get software stood up to do business with the DOD and with the intelligence community. And with our platform, now software companies can be up and running within months, so within weeks, within weeks, and at a fraction of the cost. And, and, uh, and we're almost in the quarter, and it's just amazing the, the, the velocity that we have. And so once I saw you know, the velocity, the size of the market opportunity, the, the team, the domain expertise, and the fact that it's SaaS, and the fact that it's you know, for the safety of our country, it was just a no-brainer, absolutely a no-brainer. No. Wow, that's, uh, I mean, talk about a perfect fit. That's great. Congrats. I'm glad you found something that, you know, fits uh, your interests so well. And honestly, it just sounds like a, a great opportunity that you had to jump on, to be honest. It's, yes, yes. The domain expertise is something that really stood out to me there because that's how I feel about uh, Mosaic. Like, I, I'm not a, a finance person, so I hang out on this podcast with people like you, and I, I get to learn from all of you. But when I started, like they want me to make blog posts and, and ebooks and like I, I do the content here and I'm like, how am I supposed to get a CFO to read something and like think that I actually know what they're saying? And I have to lean on all that domain expertise. And so it's mm -hmm. it's a game changer for my role. I'm sure it is for yours as well. It just to me, it's I'm not sure I'll ever take another job where that doesn't exist. So I, right. I love that story. I think it makes a lot of sense. I want to spend the time we have talking about like you said before, your onboarding period. And so what I get asked about for by a lot of people is like uh, career advice for the CFO. And what I would love to turn this into is kind of like a, a discussion of 30, 60, 90 planning for mm -hmm. onboarding. And if there's a better framework, like we can get into that. I, I just, that's kind of what I want to dig into with you. But where I want to start is just setting the stage of like what kind of company second front is. So I know you're coming from Legion, Series C company, more mature. You just said you were a Series A at second front. You're excited about product market fit. But I'm curious, like what challenges you expected to face moving from a, a Legion to an earlier stage second front? What did you think you were going to run into? What did you have to overcome? Well, the first challenge is that I'm the first finance hire. And so you, know, you never kind of know what's under the hood when you walk in. And so I was prepared for the worst. And fortunately, it's been much better than expected. We have an awesome team here. Mm -hmm. Before me, the COO was acting as the interim CFO, and she and her team have done just an amazing job. And actually, as part of the Series A raise, the lead investor required kind of a due diligence CPA review type mm -hmm. mini audit. So that was done. They passed with flying colors. There was an accounting firm that's been in place for a couple of years now. And so they, we use QuickBooks Online, we use Carta, Bill.com, Ramp. And so the, all the infrastructure is there. And so I was expecting, I didn't know what to expect coming in. And more importantly, we had cash in the bank because we just, we just raised in October of last year, which going back another requirement for coming to any new jobs in a startup, there has to be cash in the bank. I'm not going to walk into a situation where we need to raise cash to really keep the lights on. Yep. And so it doesn't need to be a three-year runway, but it also can't be, a three, it can't be a three-month runway. Either. Yeah. And so, you know, walked in expecting really to kind of figure out just kind of how things need to be set up and then internally and then how to make that a smooth transition. But fortunately, you know, the team was still in place. And so uh, we've been operating, we're really collaborating more as a partnership, more than a handoff. And so it's been working really well. It's not like being dropped completely out of finance. So 
even still, we're still doing a lot of things together as a team. Just that's just the approach. I mean, even though I may not have, although on Friday I will. Up until now, I don't have a team member. I still have the COO and who's Chrissy, by the way, and our director of operation, uh, Christy, and that the three of us really act as our finance team. And so that's been a, a really good experience. But walking into any, and to me, there's there's two types of, well, it's probably more than two, but there's at least two types of CFO roles that I see. One is CFO role of an enterprise company. You walk in, you have you know, tons of, of resources and teams and people. And then you have the CFO, the first CFO of a startup. And so like day one, you really need to know like, what is the cash situation? Like, where is the cash? And then you know, what are the needs in terms of payroll? Like, what's the size? What's my cash flow? My burn rate, my burn rate and my runway. So it's really important to figure those things out from day one. And so and that's what I did. And so uh, interesting enough, I started February 24th. And then three weeks later, we were faced with the SVB crisis. And so oh, uh, fortunately, in December of last year, before I started, the team moved about 80% of our money into a money market account with Merrill Lynch. And so coming in that week, we did have payroll coming through SVB, but we, the payroll happened that Thursday. And so our only concern was to actually go out. So we were like on the line with Just Works like all weekend. They couldn't tell us. And so over that weekend, we had opened up a B of A account that was tied to our Merrill Lynch account. So we definitely had a backup plan. Yeah. Uh, that was, you know, unexpected, obviously. But, you know, it was, we were in crisis mode and had to talk to a couple of board members over the weekend. And, but fortunately, you know, we, we did have a good backup plan and, and we did have all of our money SBB. As it turns out, when I've been issued by that Sunday, things had, had calmed down. But that's always my main focus coming to any startup CFO position is what's the cash. Nothing else matters before the cash situation. And then... I think the next is keeping the lights on. So bills need to get paid. Payroll needs to occur. There are uh, reporting requirements by, from investors and board members. And so it's, just, it's that reporting and just everyday tactical keeping the lights on. And we walk into a you know, larger enterprise, that's, you can be strategic. You can start thinking about your pie in the sky strategy for the organization and staff and but in day one in startup it's cash and keeping the lights on and makes and, and that's where it all starts makes total sense i love uh it sounds so you know i had like a follow-up question here where i kind of expected sort of what you it sounded like you expected i expected an immediate like well there were these four fires to put out and so i had to jump on these things and i had this thing written out where i was like well there's only so much time in the day how do you prioritize which ones to fix? It sounds like you really lucked out with the team of Christy and Chrissy, uh, yes. kind of keeping things or a tight ship leading into you getting there. So I guess I don't really need to go down that path, but I love where you went with uh, sort of like the day one priority. And I think that's a good way to lead into the structure I want to talk about around like 30, 60, 90 plan. So I want to start you know, with a 30 day plan, it sounds like, you know, cash runway burn, make sure you have a good handle on that. Right. I'm curious, like what, like how long does that take you to get a handle on? Like, is that the entirety of your first month is figuring that out and setting up oh, processes wow. or like, what is your, what does that 30 days look like? And how do you prioritize things? Right. Right. So cash and keeping lights on, that's literally like two days. Yeah. But by day two, have it all figured out. Also part of that is getting access to all the systems. So you know, QBO, Bill.com, yeah. Wrap, the bank, you know, so that takes, a, you know, again, two or three days to get really settled there. And then after that point, to me, the next more important is just to learn. It's just really education, learning the, not only the business, the company, the culture, the rhythm of the company. Again, this company is very military in terms of style. And so just even understanding some of the language. And so like within, yeah, I was getting emails that said FYSA. 
use the words in FYI. I'm like, what is FYSA? I had no idea. So look, look at that. It was for your situational awareness, right? Ooh, and, and that, that is, is something that is, is very military. And also they would just say SA, meaning situational awareness. And yep. so like, terms like that, and then cadre, and it's another very military term. And so just, just like learning the culture of, of just how the rhythm work, the processes, the interaction, the, the communication, this company is very Slack oriented. So you really need to keep up on all the Slack channels and you need to be conversant how Slack works at threads versus direct messages versus, you know, and so, and not so much email, which is interesting. And so just being up on Slack and making sure simple things like Slack is on my phone, Slack is on my laptop, the notifications are on. So when I get a Slack message, my phone beeps, right? Little things like that are really important because you don't want to miss a Slack message where people are expecting like instant feedback and instant comments. And so if you're used to checking email once or twice an hour or, or twice a day, you will be completely left out, MIA, and like, who is this guy and, and, and where is he, right? <laughs> and so just really kind of jumping in and fitting in, I think is so important. And then just like, learn, just listening. So I said one-on-ones with, a couple of the board members, all the ex team. And because I am on the exec team, each new hire gets to meet each exec. So I, I already had meetings on my calendar for new hires. So I spent a lot of my first few weeks just really learning company, learning the people, the names, the rhythm of the business, and just the whole you know, defense sector is very unique. It, dealing with the federal governments. I did a lot of just research around some of the terms, the organizations, the DOT. It's just education. And again, fortunately, I was in a good place because the systems were going pretty smoothly. So I could spend time just really learning and listening before I gave a lot of my, my input. But in that, in that list of things, Really, what was really important was the board members. Mm. And so there are two board members, two lead, co-lead investors in Series A, and just really getting their perspective on expectations, on their thesis, like why did they invest in Second Front? Because that helps me just visualize you know, where the company should be headed based on the original thesis. Because there are so many different ways we can take this business it's good to stay focused on, on what the investors invested in and because it is such a huge opportunity. It can be wide as well. So just getting the board's perspective, of course, I had one-on-ones with, with my CEO who happens to be local. So something else we oh, haven't nice. talked about is that Second Front is totally virtual and have never had an office. And so employees are all over the country. And but it just so happens the CEO is local. I'm here in Menlo Park, California. The CEO lives about 10 minutes away from me. Our CMO, who came out of VMware, he lives down in San Jose. And then our chief of strategy lives one city up. That's just a coincidence. Oh, my God. But now, but, but now we have critical mass. Yeah. And so within that month, we've all gotten together at least once or twice in person. And not necessarily with an agenda, but just so we could, like, be there in person and, and things just come up. And so that's been really helpful to get to learn and, and know and be acquainted with the business. It's just about listening, taking down lots of notes and being very intentional about asking questions, about meeting everyone I could think of, about sitting in on meetings that may not even be pertinent. To me. I mean, I'll, I'll sit in on a pipeline review. I'll sit on you know, a technical review just so I, I can learn. Mm -hmm. It's really about going to the, the grad school of defense tech. Yeah, I love that. I think, well, I, a follow-up I had is uh, you mentioned that obviously it's a pretty unique industry. I don't know if that translates to like a unique business structure in terms of SaaS. Like what is, do you have, do you have a sales department? I heard you mention a CMO. Like who, who are the department heads that you're working with? I heard a lot, of, like the board member thing is really cool. I've never heard anyone talk about making a point of that. 
obviously getting to meet the, the executive suite in person, amazing. What's like that next level? Who are you meeting with on the department side? Yeah, so in terms of uh, second front, we are a pure SaaS company. That's the beauty of it. So we have a CMO, CRO, we have a CTO, we have a, a, a chief data scientist, nice. and the COO. That makes up the, the executive suite. And so all our sales are subscription. Most of our business is 90% commercial, 10% government. And so we, tell, we sell to SaaS companies. We are actually a platform. It's really a PaaS company. We provide a platform as a service to SaaS companies. So we have all the typical metrics in terms of ARR and committed ARR and ACV and, and CAC and LTV. And my favorite metric is the burn metric. How much are we burning in cash to achieve the mental ARR? And so from that perspective, we are pure sales company. Well, again, which is why it's such a good fit for me in my career is because I get to take what I've learned really at Legion in terms of being a SaaS CFO and applying those metrics, that mindset to, to set. And walking in, those metrics don't exist currently. So that's one thing I'm still working on is I just can't wait for Mosaic to go live. Oh, by the way, yes, I did bring Mosaic into, into a second front. We love and, it. And within my first month. And so I was very happy to do that and had my first onboarding meeting a couple of days ago. Nice. Much appreciated. Love it. Yes, yes. And, so, and just kind of building, so now working on building those metrics so that it becomes part of the fabric of the company from of how we think, how we measure, how we impact the business going forward. And so like even right now, like I'm going through every contract, trying to figure out what our true error is. Because at the end of the day, the CFO is the one who is the official scorekeeper of ARR, of CAR. And my new head of finance who starts on Friday, he also is very detail oriented, specialized in 606 revenue, and so, like, we are a pure SaaS, and that's why a Mosaic is, is going to be just very instrumental in dashboarding and reporting and really driving the business. And, and one thing I really like about SaaS, I was just thinking about this today, is that what I really like about SaaS is that it's this recurring model of, it's really formulaic, right? Because you know every year you're getting in revenue. So you can measure things like churn and net retention. And it's like, to me, it's like, kind of like, like it's easy to measure because it has a heartbeat. Like this Fitbit watch that gives me my heart rate. My heart is usually somewhere around 48, 49. They say that's really, it could be bad or it could be good. It could be, it means you're in shape or it could be bad, meaning that it's something wrong with your heart. So. Luckily, I've gotten head checked out, and I have a marathon type heart. Nice, good, good for you. you. I, I wish, wish I did. I did. Man. <laughs> and so, but what I like about sad business, it has a heartbeat, right? Yeah. And so, Mosaic allows us to really measure that heart. And then, if it's going too slow, we can do things to speed it up. Or if it's going too fast, we can slow it down. And so, that's what I like about the SaaS just in general. It's measurable. And you can take the metrics and the results to really impact business. Okay, our churn is too high. Well, why is that? Well, let's go back and figure out why customers are leaving. Oh, our software is bugging. Oh, we're not measuring certain things. So let's now measure those, 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 not only measure, but have people be accountable for certain results. But that can start the metrics that come as a result of the heartbeat of the SaaS business. And that's no different than other businesses where it's, if it's not repeatable, it's kind of tough to diagnose like why something isn't quite working correctly. But, you know, and there's so much, so many benchmarks out there now and successful SaaS companies. And you know, I'm a big believer in the Bessemer SaaS metrics. And so I really take those benchmarks and, and we'll dashboard those in Mosaic. It's a very like forward story to tell, you know, to the board, to the exec team. Like we need to be here. Our magic number is not magic. 
And or there, it could be the other case where a magic number we actually we fit product market fit, but we're not spending fast enough, right? Because I'm yeah, because we're actually higher than one as opposed to below one in terms of magic. So there are, there are, are metrics out there that you can really use to drive the business. And another reason why I really like SaaS business versus other, you know, kind of tougher to measure businesses. No, this is all great. I love the heartbeat metaphor. I know there are going to be some people inside Mosaic that are going to be pretty excited about that. Uh, so <laughs> probably clip that, send that to people. They'll be pretty pumped. But uh, I heard in there that you, so, you know, you called uh, your first 30 days kind of like the grad school of defense tech and like that, that's great. And you said you're still working on this metric side. So like if we're transitioning into like the 60 day side of the 30, 60, 90 sort of framework, like it sounds like great. I, I've got a feel for the business. And now that I have that feel, I can start putting my metrics together. And, you know, you mentioned a lot about what that looks like. What I want to follow up on is something that we hear a lot. And I know you were at our customer summit in, in San Francisco, and I heard that there was a surprisingly heated debate about ARR versus CAR and how to define those things. And so as part of this like 60-day sort of framework, I would love to hear how you're going about defining those things for second front, because it sounds like finance leaders have a tough time figuring out what it should be, I think they would appreciate hearing like the thought process behind defining them for you. Yes, yes. A great question, Joe. At first, just to be clear, when it comes to these, these SaaS metrics, these are non-GAAP metric, right? And so it's really an agreement between the company, the board, and the investors. And so just going back to Leeds, like the Series C raise was led by an investor who was totally focused on committing ARR. Mm. Well, that was the North Star. That is the North Star at Legion. And Legion is a little different from second round. At Legion, we had almost all multi-year deals. But the first year, and the deals were based on number of locations or number of users. And so, and the way customers implement the software they were implemented one store or one retail operation at a time. So year one may only be you know, half of year two and year three. And so in that case, let's say, let's say year one revenue, ARR is 100K, year two is 200K, and year three is 300K. In that case, CAR is that third year where it's completely committed of, of 300K. Right. And in year one, AR was 100. In year two, AR 200K. In year three, AR matched car of 300K. So, and that was an agreement that was understood by the investors, by the board, and by the, the executive team. And so, here at Second Front is similar where they measured ARR before I arrived. However, most of the deals are annual. I'm not annual. They are not multi-year deals. And so you don't have that same dynamic of ARR being different from CAR because in this case, they're both the same. But as we go out and communicate with investors and with potential investors, we will always talk committed ARR. And because in the future, we could have multi-year deal. In the first year, most of our, our customers are startups. And they have one-year awards from the government. So they can't commit to a five-year deal because they get awarded one year at a time. But the great news is that it's the federal government. So every year, the budget's going to be there. They're not ripping that system out anytime soon. Once you started, you're going to keep going. <laughs> exactly. Like We are literally the plumbing of these software companies. Yeah. And everything else gets cut before the plumbing. Like you, you just don't turn your lights off. Can you imagine Joe's like, oh, I need to cut down expenses at home. I'm going to shut my water and my lights off for a while. No, that's not even an option, right? You may cut out a vacation, you know, or you may not buy that Porsche that you were thinking about, or God, but, but you're not going to cut your lights off. So, so same for our software, right? We are the platform that runs your software. And so, you know, very, very high transferring costs. And it's, it's just, 
a really good place to be in. But yeah. so again, most of our deals are one year deals. And so we don't have the same dynamic of car versus our I think I gave you a good example going back yes. going back to lead. No, that's perfect. And as somebody who just spent three days fixing an entire sink, uh, I appreciate the <laughs> reference to not getting rid of my plumbing because I wanted to get rid of my plumbing for a few days and you still can't. So yeah, totally understand that. All right. So I appreciate you indulging uh, my question about that because we've been having debates internally. Uh, and so the example you gave is great. What else would you mention about your 60 days? You mentioned you're just coming up at the end of the 60 days. So this is kind of the last, you know, concrete experience that we could talk about. When we get in 90, we're looking ahead. So what else did you work on in the second month other than, you know, defining some of these metrics that we've talked about? So these probably the second most important thing after cash and keeping the lights on is the team and my team. And so, so building out my organizational structure and what I need to be to be successful, which I actually made sure that was the case before I even took the job. I need, I need there to be a commitment that the finance team needs to have a strong accounting foundation and a strong FPLA foundation. And so that was part of, you know, really my strategy was to bring on just a team of three, the three of us, maybe a fourth person to do some accounting, but you know, that those four, in my opinion, could take us to easily north of $50 million, especially because we do a six figure deals here. And so we don't have like tons of invoices and you know, we're not looking at MRR and, and a lot of just, you know, just cycles, but it's big deals. They come in very predictable. And so, but just having a strong team in place. And so, you know, I came in saying, this is what the size of team that I need. And so, you know, the first month I really kind of built out the, the job description along with our, our talent manager. And we put it out to uh, LinkedIn, to Indeed. And lo and behold, we, we hire an awesome head of finance and accounting. And Jimmy Sung starts on Friday. We're so excited. And, but uh, coming in, it's interesting, though, is... My plan was to bring in a controller to really make sure we had, you know, strong processes and systems are all in line. And also there was a requirement in the investor rights agreement that our financials be audited. And so that's another priority is, so I've also engaged a couple of audit firms to get proposals and also an advisory firm to help prepare our financial statements, our 606 stock-based compensation um, disclosures. And so my plan was to hire a controller and then two months after that, bring on an FPLA person to really start working on next year's plan, our actual financial plan. And, and we're on a, our year end is January 31st. First, okay. so we are at the end of Q1 FY24. Yep, and so the next plan needs to be FY25 needs to be done by by January of next year. So I felt you know get some money in on the summer that gives them plenty of time to uh, start working on the plan in Mosaic and have it up and and time for the board. To However, as I you know started talking to candidates. My Jimmy Sung came and he has great experience in both accounting and finance. And he's done quite a few budgets and he's a CPA. He's gone through several audits. And so now my perspective has changed and I was able to get finance and accounting in one failed school. And so that was just really just, just, it was unexpected, but I'm very, very you know, excited by that. And now, and his philosophy is that so we'll hire a probably senior accountant or maybe an accounting manager. But it will be a hybrid. It will be someone who can do accounting and FPA, yeah. right? And so it won't be what I envisioned was finance on one side, accounting on the other side. But now it's going to be kind of hybrid all the way down the organization. So team was really important. So yeah. and, and so that, and that 
is like, and my philosophy is like, yo, find someone who's smarter than I am, especially on the accounting side. I'm, I'm an MBA, Stanford yeah. MBA. And so, yeah, I, I wanted a, a strong CPA. And, and this is exactly what I found. Wow. That's a, uh... Listen, Jervis, the, the whole time you've been talking, it sounds like you've hit like really unicorn situation. It seems like all these like things just keep falling into place for you. I'm sure there are many challenges. You'll face many challenges moving forward. But, you know, you started off, you were like, well, I thought there'd be fi some fires put out. And instead, they did an amazing job. And now it's like, well, I thought I'd need a controller. I found someone who can do both. That's amazing. I love the adaptability of like, you know, obviously you had a vision for how this team was going to look and cool to hear you talk about how you kind of adjusted that philosophy and how you're going to move it going forward. So really yes. love that. Want to keep us moving because I know uh, I could probably talk to you for a really, really long time and I can't do that because you're a CFO and you don't have that much time. So I talked about Actually, defining so, that. I have to about seven o'clock. That's when the Warriors and the, and the uh, Sacramento Kings tip off. Oh, so. Uh, so I, I'm I'm fine for the next three and a half hours. <laughs> I uh, I want you to be mentally prepared for that game. I hope uh, <laughs> hope it goes well. That's been an amazing series, by the way. Uh, Absolutely. So Absolutely. That, I remember actually. This is a, a complete tangent, but the last time you and I chatted was for a webinar, or maybe the, it was yes. the time before that. But it was during the NBA Finals last year, and it was yes. my hometown, Boston Celtics yes. versus your Warriors, and I was yes. I was needling you a little bit about that. And I was very wrong, so I was a little disappointed. Right. But I am crossing my fingers for a rematch, which is looking like a challenging road, but I would love it. It'd be great. I would, too. I would, too. That'd be great. Oh, man. Yeah. Love it. So we talked about defining metrics. We talked about building out the team in those 60 days. You're coming up on the end of those 60 days. Let's look into moving forward in the framework of what we're talking about. We're talking about 30, 60, 90, but might as well just talk about like what's next since you're coming up on that end of two months. Yeah, so, Where so do you now... Go? Yeah, I've spent 60 days kind of assessing the, the organization, building the team, you know, keeping the lights on. Now, 60 and 90 between, and now it's like, it's time for, here's my state of the union, right? Here's what I've seen. Here's where we are. And here is where we need to go in terms of from a strategy standpoint. And it just so happens that our board meeting is coming up in a couple of weeks, actually middle of May, May 15th. And by the way, today is April 26th. So it's, it's about th three weeks. From now. Yeah. And so that's where I will get my oh. platform to be about, to talk about the and our finance strategy. And I've had similar discussion. And so first I need to socialize that state of the union with the exec team. And so just last night, I saw our chief revenue officer who's in town for RSA. So we got to spend time, you know, just a one on one in person. And I kind of talked about here's what I've seen, here's what I envision for sales and marketing. And so now I'm starting to socialize you know, my thoughts about the business, about what we should focus on with the exec team, and then you know, get agreement and buy in. So by the time the board thing comes around in about three weeks, we're all on the same page and we have a really roadmap or playbook in terms of our finance. Love that. I think uh, where I want to dig into, uh, I, I don't need the, the whole overview of like, you know, what that finance strategy looks like, but we've talked sort of like people processes and you've mentioned Mosaic, which, you know, thank you. Love that, that we get to be part of this journey with you. I want to ask like, are there any other tech investments that you're looking at making moving forward? So, you know, you've talked about a lot of, you know, setting up the foundation and that just feels like one thing that we haven't touched on yet. I'd love to know if you're, you're looking at certain systems or implementations that you need to work on before we, uh, go. Uh, from a system standpoint, not really again, That's great. QuickBooks online and between QuickBooks and Mosaic that really covers my, you know, business intelligence data. Yeah. I know. Um, there are other systems out there like NetSuite, Intact that could be used for things, but you know, we're just we're just too small. Cash is so important. I'd rather put that hundred k into an engineer than I would into a system or a company our size. And so, really, once we take is in place, I have no plans for any more systems for a while. On the HR side, we're implementing Lattice, 
for performance reviews, for for surveys, for one-on-ones, things like that. But on the finance side, once I have Mosaic in place, that's it from the system. Yeah. Love it. Plus one to Lattice, we use it as well. But yeah, I mean, that, that's great to hear. I think that's uh, it's what a lot of finance people would like to hear. It's what uh, our talking point is a little bit around NetSuite. It's like, hey, you got to prolong that migration as, as long as you can because early on, way too expensive. And I've heard a lot of nightmare stories about trying to move over. And, you know, once you do, every, everything is good. I, I talked to Edwin at, at Ramp in her journey there, but man, the, the journey is tough. So don't blame you at all for keeping it simple and glad we can help you do that. Love the framework we've had. The, the next set of questions I had, we, we've already covered. So I, I want to talk about the hire because I saw when you were on LinkedIn looking for the controller and I was like, oh, hey, like Jervis is in his like, onboarding period. He's looking to hire. So I love that we covered that. What I'd love to get into is sort of a last few questions. One is just like, you know, you're not at the end of 90 days, but you're at the end of your 60 days. Is there anything you would have changed over these first 60 days? You've learned, you know, you've been through two months now as a new CFO. Again, anything you'd do differently if you had to start over? Hmm. Sounded pretty solid to me. Yeah, but, uh, no, I've I'd had choose. a really good 60 days. It, it <laughs> sounds I would say some of that I've learned from my previous roles at Legion and MetaWave. Hmm. Like if, if you were to ask me the same question, when I started Legion, I would have said, I would have started working on my hire from day one. So that's what I've done, at least not day one, but at least in the first 30 days, I've improved there at, at second front. And so the great part about this being my third you know, startup CFO is I've learned from the first two. And so, and that, that's helped me just be more intentional about the person today. Also what I did between uh, the two jobs, I actually went out on the web and found some, <laughs> there's this, there's this uh, framework called by Michael Watkins called the first 90 days. I literally had pulled that up. Our, I had some time in between the two jobs and I, I pulled that up and then there's another one from the Jackson Hole. And it, it's very similar and it's called it's something to do with the, uh, the first 90 days. And so, and so that's helped me be, be very in, intentional about having this plan. Here it is. The Jackson Hole, Jackson Hole group is called the first hundred achieving immediate results. And uh, oh, so I've been using this. And that's where I, I really got the idea of uh, meeting with my stakeholders, including the board yep. and, and having them you know, buy in early, early on, because really the CFO I report to the CFO, but I also report to the board as well. And so that, that's something that I it didn't necessarily do in my first two jobs, but, but here I was very intentional. I love that. I will absolutely link to those two uh, papers, books in the show notes. Uh, that's awesome and fits in line exactly with what we're talking about. So I love that you did that. Sounds like the adjustments you've made heading into second front have really worked out for you. There's something you mentioned, and it leads to a question that I wanted to ask next. We hear, we at Mosaic talk a lot about like the value of investing early in finance, not just in a system like Mosaic, because obviously we want people to buy Mosaic, but also just like hiring someone in finance as early as possible. Like if you've, if you think it's, you've gone too far, like you probably have. So I'm curious, like you're in pretty early. What do you think some of the benefits are of bringing someone like yourself in? or even like a, maybe like a more junior, like a head of finance or something as early as possible in the road for a startup. What does that do for the company when someone like you is there? Yeah, I think there's a couple of benefits. One's internal and one's external. Internally, yeah, it's really finance, the role, it sets the tone from a financial standpoint for the company in terms of are we disciplined? Is somebody watching how we spend money? Does someone care? You know, as an employee, how am I, am I submitting expense reports? Yeah, as, as a budget manager, am I accountable for how we spend money? And so it just brings that discipline and that good hygiene to the organization. And you don't want the organization to be, you know, 150 people who don't really have their discipline and their money's just going out the door, just unchecked. And so... Bringing that in as early as possible is really important. 
And then externally, just in terms of, you know, most startups, all startups are fundraising mode. And so you know, having that person who's a solely accountable is important to, to investors, the board, to potential investors. Also, this is someone who can you know, sit next to the CEO and confirm, yes, you know, these numbers are accurate. Yes, we have the processes and procedures in place to make sure we're hitting our targets to have that predictability and just having that just repeatability of the business really comes through that structure that that finance brings more than anything else. So it's important internally, externally. And, you know, I think getting that person on board as soon as possible is really important for any startup. Well, that I think, I, mean, I think we're seeing it too. Like I, I know I started here writing for Mosaic in late 2020. And that was something that, that we harped on a lot was like, Hey, like you need to get your finance person in the door sooner. And I think we've seen that happening. Like when we talk to series A companies now, it's not always like the CEO or like the founder talking to us. It's often a finance person like yourself who is looking to buy a system like Mosaic. So great progress for the industry. I think people seeing the value of the role that you guys do, because it is important, especially for a company that is spending money like startups do. So right. I love all that. Jervis, we're coming up on time. I have, I have one last question for you. And it, you know, for once, uh, usually like it doesn't really fall in line with the topic, but today it does because we're talking about careers. It's something I ask everyone that comes on. So I want to know what is one thing you know now that you wish you knew way back when you started your career? I would say the one thing I know now is that it's okay to be fluid in your career and to like, I've had three CFO jobs in six years, right? And don't have to worry about the career risk of, oh, you know, Jervis is moving jobs hmm. because in reality, I'm learning so much at every stop that I look at each job opportunity as a step on my path. And so I have benefited at every step of my previous job and wouldn't say that was the case if I'd been at one job for six years. I think I, I have accelerated my career by being at three jobs in six years versus one job in six years. Love that. There's like a stigma against uh, job hopping is like a really negative term that I, I don't love, but that's what it's perceived as. And right. I think that's a really good way to look at it, especially, you know, if anyone listening to this is, you know, thinking about moving on to a new role, it's probably a good way to position yourself as you're interviewing in that role. If they ask a question about, you know, kind of being fluid, as you said. So I it's a really good frame of mind for that. It makes a lot of sense to me. Love that. All right. All right, Jervis, that was our last question. I know running a little long here, so I apologize, but I always love talking to you. I want to turn the floor over to you. Just say thank you for, for being on and where can people go to connect with you, to learn more about the work you're doing at Second Front, anything you want to plug or propose, it's floor is yours, sir. Oh, sure. Thank you. So I'm easy to find. I'm in LinkedIn, Jervis Williams, CFO of Second Front. And I just want to encourage all the finance professionals out there to, you know, really reach out and build your network. And so feel free to add me and I'm always available to chat. I have my own kind of personal set of advisors that I will just call occasionally and I'm willing and open to being, you know, one of your advisors if, <laughs> if, if you so choose. And so I just think networking and just finding out best practices and just getting that second and third opinion is always very helpful. So I'm available to all and, and uh, feel free to connect anytime. Love that. That's very kind of you as somebody who has gotten to talk to you a few times to get your insight into finance things. I highly recommend actually taking Jervis up on this offer. So I hope you don't get too many messages because you uh, a busy okay. man. Jervis, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. I think this is a great episode. A lot of great things that you uh, can teach everyone. And yeah, just want to say thanks for being on the roll forward and hope to do it again sometime. That sounds good. Thanks, Joe, for having me. 
Thank you for checking out this episode of The Roll Forward. This show is powered by Mosaic, a strategic finance platform that transforms the way business gets done. If you enjoyed what you learned in this episode, make sure to follow The Roll Forward wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Or visit mosaic.tech slash podcast to get immediate access to all of the latest episodes. 